Pushkin. DJ Drama is one of the most iconic mixtape DJs of all time. His legendary Gangsta Grills tapes helped propel artists like T.I. and Young Jeezy to stardom. His classic dedication series reinvigorated Lil Wayne's career in the early and mid-2000s. At their height, mixtapes like DJ Dramas allowed artists the freedom to rap over other people's beats and release new music to fans in between their major label projects. By 2007, the underground mixtape market was booming. But in January of that year, DJ Drama and his longtime business partner Don Cannon were arrested by federal agents and charged under RICO laws for bootlegging and racketeering. Their arrest resulted in the federal government confiscating hundreds of thousands of dollars from their business accounts. But the much-publicized raid only boosted DJ Drama's profile. In the years since, Drama's built a successful record label and has continued to make mixtapes. Tyler, the creator, even crafted his latest album, Call Me If You Get Lost, with DJ Drama's classic ad-libs all over it and won the Grammy for Best Rap Album in 2022. But at that same time, while DJ Drama was at the height of his professional success, personally, he was battling an addiction to opioids, an ongoing struggle he's only recently started to talk about publicly. On today's episode, Leah Rose, who some of you may know as the former music editor of Double XL Magazine, talks to Drama about how he got sober after being what he calls a functioning junkie who spent six figures a year on opioids. He also tells the story of how Lil Jon recorded his iconic Gangsta Grills drops in Drama's laundry room and explains why he decided to sign Lil Uzi Vert and Jack Harlow to his Atlantic Records imprint, Generation Now. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Leah Rose with DJ Drama. So back when I was at XXL, I used to edit a section of the magazine called Show and Prove, mm-hmm. where every month I would have to find five new artists from like all over the country. And I figured out that if I talked to mixtape DJs, they could kind of like plug me in with who was who and who was doing what where. Mm-hmm. And you were my guy in Atlanta. I remember us frequently talking. Exactly. Yeah, it's been about 20 years. Mm-hmm. And your career has grown in so many different incredible ways. Mm-hmm. So for people listening who might not be familiar with the function of a mixtape in hip hop can you describe what the purpose is just at like the base level like what is the purpose of a mixtape so a mixtape obviously through the years has taken on various purposes and different meanings me specifically or my brand of of gangster girls mixtapes came at a time when mixtapes had become almost like street albums in a sense where they were based around, you know, one particular artist or one particular crew of artists or a label of some sorts. And it enabled that artist to kind of do things that they may not have been able to do on their major label album in a sense where they could kind of have a free for all or, you know, rap on someone else's beat, you know, just kind of experiment and not worry about, you know, some of the, 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 the caution tape that comes with putting out an actual album. So a mixtape and a lot of times in, in though in the early years would almost be kind of like lead lead ups to someone's mm-hmm. album, or it would be a project that would come in between albums, you know, to keep the anticipation high and, mm-hmm. You know, then then there would be what my my participation in it as the DJ is kind of like properly putting the mixtape together, sequencing it, you know, adding bells and whistles, sound effects, yeah. you know, giving what are known as either sermons or rants, depending on who you ask. Yeah. And like, you know, bringing back records just to kind of like create these moments and, and, and this excitement of almost like almost like being like a a coach or the, you know, the, yeah. the, the guy in the, the box with corner who's hyping up the artists in a sense and, you know, hyping up the audience as well. And just like, you know, adding my two cents to the records. And so when it came 
to you adding your your ad libs and your drops and everything, it really seems like it's such an art and it's very intentional. First of all, how did you develop your style? I was listening to old tapes. You're screaming. It's like hoarse mm-hmm. voice. Mm-hmm. There's a little like, you know, echo effect. How did you develop your own individual style? Well, it kind of changed over the years, interestingly. So, you know, in the earlier years, obviously, when you go listen, like, I'm definitely more boisterous and louder than I may be in today's time. But the style came in like, that's what mixtape DJs would do in in my era. Like, you know, I came up listening to people like Clue or or SNS Mm -hmm. or or who kid who, you know, they all DJs would, would pretty much say their names and, and like, you know, have an echo of effect, but, but they also like, it was in a time where mixtape DJs were doing more of like shout outs and maybe like promoting the stores where their tapes were sold or, yeah. you know, shouting out the A&Rs that were getting them records and things like that. And I, I kind of, I kind of came up with a style where, for me, it was almost like adding personality to the records. I wanted to be more than just kind of like just saying my name where, you know, I was kind of like talking shit and, you know, in a sense, like adding my two cents almost in a way of like, you know, I don't rhyme, you know, my, my statements don't rhyme, but I try to be creative as possible with what I say and add to the record as much, as much as I can. And you know, yeah, in the early years, it was like, you know, the type of music that I was lending my voice to was was very, like, commanding and, you know, it was intense. And then over the years, I started to, you know, do work on various projects. You know, then I, I started to even play around with my tone and my and my pitch. And, like, I would do a, mm-hmm. a tape like Verde Terrace with Currency, where it was like, you know, it was it's, it's smoker music, so... You know, I would. You can't come off like screaming. Yeah, I would have to kind of like come back in in a in a mellower tone, or or I would start to do like R and B mixtapes with people like Chris Brown or or Jeremiah, and then it was like again, I couldn't come on there yelling and screaming, so I would (laughs) I would then you know find a different tone and play around with it, and in a sense, it was it was it's art to me, like you know, it, it was like knowing where to come and and what to say and and how to to lend myself to the record so it wasn't yeah and when to pull back exactly when to talk and it's really like you're punctuating things that people say in a way that sometimes it's subconscious as a listener you're listening and then you might be like oh and then that line will sink in and then you start to say that as like you start to know that as part of the song no nah, and i love that yeah exactly so yeah. you know and then one of the the biggest compliments to me at times is when, you know, there'd be versions of projects that didn't have me on there and people be like, yeah, yeah. just doesn't hit the same without drama on there. It's really not as good. Yeah. It's really, really not. So I love that. It's so exciting. Your drops are so, it's just so well done. Man, thank you. And I just wanted to play you this. I don't know. Let's see if you can hear this. Wow. Yeah. Classic. So that's from Dedication 2. Yeah. Which now is just like widely regarded as the best mixtape of all time. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah, you got your shout out on there. That's fire. But, you know, you guys, you know, you and Double XL were very important and influential to like mixtapes and mixtape culture at that time and like and I remember like the feeling of you know opening up a double XL and seeing one of my my tapes in there or it being reviewed or you know what I'm saying like that was like the holy grail you know what I mean that was you know you guys were one, one of the the few outlets where you know we, we, we were getting our praise or you know outside of the 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 listener or the person who was familiar with the mixtape circuit or what we were doing where yeah. a consumer who might not have been familiar could find out about, you know, what I was doing. Yeah. I mean, you were absolutely keeping the music exciting. You yeah. were keeping it going. Appreciate that. So when it came to making dedication to, I heard you talk about how you would sometimes script out things for 
for the artist to say. And in Wayne's case with that tape, you sort of like set it up like an interview. Yeah. So in those days when I was doing tapes, you know, I would yeah make a script like, you know, outside of the music, you know, some of the things that were important to those tapes were somewhat of the interludes or, you know, it was almost like behind the scenes of some of the things mm-hmm. that, you know, you wouldn't get from the artist on, on a project. So I, when I was, when I would do dedications, you know, I would almost like I would write a script out for Wayne to, to record some things outside of the music. I would literally like almost like ask him questions. So, you know, around those times there were, there were things about, him retiring or him signing to Jay-Z or like, you know, I remember asking him like, you know, what, what do you like to watch on television? And that was when he was like, all I watch is sports, 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 you know, and, and I, he had actually freestyled over this Green Lantern beat that had been used. That was like, became sports center, you know, where it was like the sound of a basketball or uh, a tennis ball or what, what have you. And I, I, I called it sports center. And that kind of came from my my interviewing background, I guess, in the sense yeah. of like when I would get my my drops from the artists, I would I would set it up where I would you know engage him, and this is what the fans want to know. So there would be kind of yeah. questions he would answer, and those those would would turn into the interludes, or you know the so way smart. I would, the way I would go from transition from song to song. It's such a good idea because an artist, especially Wayne, he doesn't really do interviews, right? And, you know, like those, those tapes, like Dedication 1 and Dedication 2, like the interludes of him talking are like so key or so memorable, you know. Yeah. There were just things on there that like came out of me writing these scripts and, and him responding to it. I have to ask you about Dedication 7. Is it coming out? <laughs> it's been getting teased since I think 2020. It's a good question. I hope so. Are you waiting to hear too? Yeah, I'm still waiting to hear, but I'm sure he'll start getting the itch. He always starts getting the itch and then, you know, I'll get a phone call and it'll be time to go. How did the original session where you recorded the drops with Little John, what do you remember about that session? And just talk a little bit about what Little John is like. I think a lot of people sort of think of of him as maybe a caricature because of the you know, because of the Chappelle skit and the what? Mm-hmm. I mean, talk about what Little John is actually like in real life. All right. Well, first of all, the fact that you called it a session is the most hilarious thing ever because it took place in my duplex in the fourth ward where I where most people would keep their washer and dryer is where I kept my equipment. So it was the, the fact that it's called a session, like it was not in some fancy studio with some big ass mixing board like there was two turntables and a four track in there but you know john is has always been one of the most uh down to earth humble uh laid back and giving people that i've met within the music business you know i i, I got to beat him at an early age for me um when i was kind of just transitioning from being a college DJ to really just getting into the business. And he was the king of crunk. It was a time before, you know, the the explosion of the Chappelle show. But, you know, John was definitely a, a, a very key figure within the Atlanta hip hop scene, as well as, mm-hmm. you know, being becoming a national, an international star. And this was at a time when when Gangsta Grills, like as a mixtape, was just becoming a series. And, you know, having a, a, a host of your mixtape was a very important thing, at least from mm-hmm. a up north perspective. Like, you know, and I was following a lot of the up north east coast trends of mixtapes. And, you know, people were having people like Puffy and Nas and, you know, just all these, you know, huge artists hosting their mixtapes and I was like, yeah, I need to I need to find a host for, you know, a gangster girls to make it seem like it was something, you know, and legit. Yeah, yeah. like it make it seem legit. It's like a cosign too. Cosigns a- are always absolutely legit. cosigns are important. So I, I, I remember asking like 
three people around that time. And two of them pretty much told me no. And John was the one that told me yes. He would host the tape for me. And he came to my crib again, like this raggedy ass uh, duplex I had for Fort of Atlanta. And he did the drops for me. I, I think I either wrote out a script or I would just tell him, yeah, can you say this? Can you say that? And in him doing those drops, the way he said Gangsta Grizzles. Gangsta, Gangsta, Gangsta Grizzles. You know, he did that on his own. And he hosted, it was the third Gangsta Girls I did. Um, I had did two before. And at the time they were just, they were still just like compilations. You know, they were just like the best, the hottest songs in the South that I was putting together. And he was the first host of Gangsta Girls, um, which turned out to be Gangsta Girls 4. So, you know, that tape has him all over it. And then the next tape that I did, when I did Gangsta Girls 5, it was time to put a tape out, but I couldn't find anyone to host in time. So instead of, you know, having a host, I just used little John's voice saying Gangsta Grizzles and ran it back a uh, abundance of times all over the music kind of like to brand it in a sense and you know the drop went on to be quite legendary but yeah john is you know for for those who see him as a character like you know he knows when to turn it on and you know yeah. some, somewhat similar to me i mean i don't go around screaming all day every day like i'm doing a mixtape but like you know he's 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 one of the most creative, hardworking, you know, guys in the business, you know, that, that really, you know, has, has guided himself to an, a, a, an incredible career, you know, from, from production to, you know, artist to DJ to, you know, just rock star in a sense. Did you coach him to say it a certain way? Did no, he did that on his own. And when you heard that, like, did you know, were you like, ooh, that's good? I didn't know. He just said it. He said it like that. He said, Gangsta Grizzlies. You know, and it was crazy is that I never realized, now looking back on it, there was a Hot Boy song prior to Gangsta Grills where Manny Fresh actually says Gangsta Grizzlies. Really? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious if that's where John got it from. I never knew. I, I really, I've recently just heard it like in the last like, two, three months where Manny Fresh says Gangsta Grizzlies. And this was a record from like 98, 99. So wow. it came before Gangsta Grills. And, you know, and, and but even at that time, that's not even where I got the name for the tape. Like, I just kind of came up with Gangsta Grills in itself. So, you know, huh. great minds think alike. But I didn't know that him saying that would turn out to be so iconic or, yeah. you know, turn into like what it is today. But I was always very keen on on branding early on. How did you learn about branding? Because you're obviously so good at it. Where does that instinct come from? Well, I remember taking a marketing class in college and, you know, I was a I was a radio TV film major, but mm -hmm. as a mass communications major, we had to take some business classes. It was mandatory and marketing was one of them. And I remember just it was during the time when I was in college and I was very earnest on my mixtape hustle mm -hmm. and my marketing class, just like every part of it fascinated me into what I was doing with my business or my mixtapes. And like, I, I was applying everything that I was learning to my craft. Yeah. And, you know, I just remember again, just like, just even early on, just, studying DJs like Flex and Capri and, and Bismarck, you rest in peace. Like, you know, just, just how, how big of a brand Funkmaster Flex was and, you know, watching him and, and even Clue as well. Like, Clue, yeah. you know, just, just watching like, you know, them beyond the mixtape, like, you know, get endorsements and become figures on television and things like that. So, you know, one, Becoming a mixtape DJ for me was was key because the mixtape DJ in hip hop for me was the larger than life hmm. DJ. You know, those were the DJs that were treated like artists. You know, those were the DJs that were the ones that 
people knew outside of the city they were from, Mm -hmm. you know, and even when I was approaching gangster grills, for me, it was like, my goal was to create a brand from the mixtape that people recognized even bigger than at the time DJ drama, you know, like most DJs at the time were trying to make a name for themselves or make sure their, their name as a DJ was, the most well-known and I, I I approached it in a sense where I'm going to make this brand, this mixtape brand, Gangsta Grills, the biggest brand where when people see it, they automatically want it regardless of who's on it or, you know, what it is. If they see a new Gangsta Grills that they're going to cop it. And I was like, through that, then I can kind of double back and create the brand of DJ drama, you know? So in those days for me, Gangsta Grills was a larger brand than DJ Drama. And then I started applying, okay, now I'm going to go and put my my face on a, on the Gangsta Grills along with the artists and start, you know, branding myself and, and making myself known once Gangsta Grills was already a, a, a known brand. Yeah. And then, you know, it's just, again, like, you know, branding through the years, um, I guess it's something that kind of has come somewhat natural in a sense. I think or just so. like it must it feels like an innate ability because you have you have a real solid instinct for it you know you've been able to maintain it for 20 years 20 years in so many different areas so yeah it yeah. definitely feels like something that comes naturally to you yeah thank you you know that's key in hip hop i mean when you think about it i mean from from dj drama to to gangster grills to generation now to yeah dedication to you know there's just so many things that that i'm attached to that are you know known within the culture at the height of gangster grills like would you say the height was like oh five oh six ish i think it's had different different heights i think oh five oh six was like the first peak that was the first peak definitely do you have an idea roughly of how many copies you were selling per month and how much how much you were making per month on the tapes I was probably selling like, you know, between each tape, it was, you know, just coming from my backyard, probably like maybe 20, 35,000 tapes, you know, just for me. But then again, like that's not including the bootleggers and yeah, it was bootleg- the people that were taking, that were taking masters. So, you know, there were, there were hundreds of thousands of copies. Like I'm sure in that time there were, you know, a million physical gangster girls if we're including the the Jeezy tapes and the Wayne tapes and you know all the various tapes and then like monetarily wise I was you know bringing in 50, 60, 70 80,000 dollars a month like you know money that I had like never seen or been familiar with so it was it was a hell of a time and then all that changed on uh, the morning of January 16th, 2007. Can you just tell us quickly what happened that morning and what you remember from that day? I got raided. <laughs> I came to the studio that day and I had gotten tipped off that uh, that they were coming to the studio, but I thought it was a mix-up or a mistake. And I went outside to go move my car. I let my employees know, like, y'all just got a weird call that, you know, the cops are coming over here. And I went to go move my car. When I went outside, you know, they, they pulled up with, you know, Tahoe's with the, the lights and helicopter was above my head. And they jumped out with M16s and, you know, told me to get on the ground and told me Tyree Simmons, you're being arrested for bootlegging and racketeering under the RICO law. And, you know, they, they they tore the studio apart and, you know, they were looking for guns and drugs and, you know, all they found was mixtapes. And, you know, I remember being taken down the right street and, you know, sitting in the holding cell and somebody tapping me like, look, you're on TV. And, you know, that was what they know is like the day the game changed within the mixtape world. Because, like, you know, I was like top of the food chain. I was one of the biggest mixtape DJs in the world at the time. And, you know, it was like 
man, if, if DJ Drama can get locked up, like nobody's safe. What happened when you were in jail? How long did you have to stay? I was only there for like 24 hours. We got a $100,000 bond. And, you know, I had a lot of hip hop conversations, honestly. I was, you know, with, you know, the guys that were, were locked up or the inmates, like we just had rap talk. But I remember getting out and, you know, it literally like changed my life overnight. I became this, I became the rep- a representation of like, the, what was wrong with within the music business and you know it, it definitely made me more famous than i was and you know my record label was pretty excited they were yeah. like oh we can't pay for this type of publicity at the time i was signed to atlantic records as an artist to put out a an, an album official gangster grills yeah official gangster grills album so you know they were like oh how fast can we get the album done like you know there were negative effects right it wasn't all positive when you came out well, they, they froze my bank account, so they, they kept my money. They, they kept, like, six figures of a, an account that I had had. Um, but, but beyond that, there weren't that many negative effects to it. I mean, it pretty much made me, like, you know, it, it made more people want to interview me, put me on more magazine covers than I was, like, made me more recognizable to people outside of, you know, the, the mixtape world. And I became, you know, larger than, than I was, you know, and, and at the time, like for another person or another situation, that could have been the end of, end of the story. But like, you know, for me, I was like, this is just a, one chapter of my story. Like, this is not what, this is not going to define my whole career. Like, you know, it'll definitely be a talked about moment, but I got, you know, so much to accomplish. And yeah, that was what I would, I would say at the time, not knowing how much of a career I was set out to have, but, you know, I definitely knew that I wasn't going to like lay down and let this be the end. You know what I'm saying? Especially because of how much I loved mixtapes. Like, and I, I felt, I felt some guilt. That was, that was the only, only other bad part was the guilt I felt like, I didn't want to see this culture that I love so much die on my back, you know, that I came up loving and, and wanting to be a part of. Because it was sort of a situation at that time where album sales were down across the music industry, mixtape sales were up, and mixtape DJs were making a bunch of money, and record labels were losing money. Yeah, it was like the Wild Wild West. Yeah. Because, I mean, technically, mixtapes weren't even supposed to be making money, like, there was always the quote unquote for promotional use only stigma attached to it. Right. And then, you know, outside of what myself or, you know, other well-known mixtape DJs were doing, there were also just not even DJs, but mixtape guys that were stealing MP3s and hacking Gmail and getting, records that weren't sanctioned by the artist or the label and right. they were putting them out. So, you know, it was, it was becoming like overly saturated and, you know, it was, it was becoming a problem. And then on top of that, the music business was in a decline. Album sales were in a decline. So, you know, it was kind of like some were looking at it like, Oh, this is the, this is the music business way of sending a message to the mixtape DJs like, yo, Y'all going to stop this shit. Cut you know it out. Saying? Stop taking our money. But yeah. meanwhile, you were promoting the artists like Wayne and Jeezy would tour off your mixtapes. Definitely. I mean, the artists were, you know, they were able to go on and, you know, tour and make money off of the music that was coming off of their mixtapes, as well as, you know, those mixtapes were used as promotional tools to lead up to people's albums. Oh, yeah. You know, they were they were part of the marketing plan of the labels. Like, yeah, before we do an album, we got to go do against the girls to create some hype and anticipation. Right. And the labels would pay for them at times. They would. They definitely would. Yeah, I was definitely getting paid by labels to do tapes. Did it scare you after the raid? Did it stop you from doing tapes? No, I didn't. it didn't scare or stop me. You know, I kind of stopped the regular numbered Gangsta Girl series. Mm-hmm that I had been doing because I was more focused on 
individual artist tapes, but I went and did like Gangsta Girls 16 and 17 after the raid. And I continued to do mixtapes, as did other people. I mean, yeah. you know, it was mixtapes are a part of the culture. Like they'll they'll never go anywhere. Um, even though through the years they've they've changed of how they may be presented or looked or what have you. Like I, I continued on after that. I it, it didn't it didn't stop me. We're gonna pause for a quick break and then be back with more from DJ Drama and Leah Rose. We're back with more from DJ Drama and Leah Rose. Recently, you did a talk as part of a mental health awareness month with Shanti Das. Yeah. And you opened up about your struggle with opioid addiction. Mm-hmm. When did you decide to, to come public with that? My opioid journey started somewhere around like um, 20... 15 or something around there or or to be honest like a lot of it started because of my my issues with 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 sleep like i was um i I had really bad sleeping patterns and stuff and I, i started drinking a lot of lean in the early 2000s and you know by kicking that habit i then started to i think i went from lean to xanax than to Percocets. And, you know, um, I started to realize it was a problem around like maybe like 2018 because I had never, I had never really knew the, the effects of withdrawals. Mm-hmm. And I went through withdrawals um, from Percocets and it was like a, a pain or a feeling I had never felt ever before in my life. I remember telling myself at the time, like, I'll never go another day without a Percocet. And that was really where my, like, my my addiction or my habit, like, went into, like, a, a different space. And it, it really became a, a, a serious, like, issue and problem. And in 2020, right when COVID hit, um, I went to rehab. And that was my first, that was my first time in rehab. And in a facility trying to, you know, deal with my opioid addiction. And I spent some time um, there during the beginning of COVID and I came out and I stayed clean for some months. And then I relapsed probably around the end of 2020. So I went through all of 2021 back on perks. And then I was about to go on tour in 2022 and, and I just remember having this, you know, and, and, and while I was in rehab, the, the first time I met my therapist, I had tried therapy before, but I didn't really find a person that was very suitable for me. And when I went to rehab, I found a therapist that just was the perfect fit for me. In what way? Like, what, what did she provide for you? She provided, when I, when I told her, when I sat down and I pretty much in our first session told her my life story or as much as I could in an instance, I just remember her responses to me or her assessment of me was so on point um, off top. And it was just like, you know, it was, it was almost mind boggling. The feeling that I got from the the therapist prior to her was almost like a warm blanket, you know, Hmm. and Amy who was my current therapist who I met was like, you know, she didn't take any, she didn't take any shit or she didn't let me get away with bullshit or she held me accountable. You know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't, if I would tell her something that, you know, I was doing or, you know, that was not good. She would be like that you're full of shit or that's uh, no, that's not good. You know? So once I left, rehab it was was, it's a place called mount sinai because of the laws i wasn't able to have her as my therapist for a certain amount of time but after that time passed i reached back out to her and was like yo you said after the two months or the three months whatever you know i I could see if you were available and she was like yeah i'm all um we can so and she had tried to hook me up with another therapist to 
for me to go see at when I left the facility and even with him, it was, it just wasn't the right fit. Like she was just the one for me. <laughs> um, I, I relapsed in 2020. Um, I was taking perks all through 2021. I had a, a, a situation where I, I literally almost overdosed. Where were you when that happened? I was in Atlanta. I was at home and I was taken to the hospital and I was put in a situation where they were going to 1016 me, which means they were going to keep me for a certain amount of time because of when I, when they gave me the Narcan, which they give to like people who are almost going to overdose. Like I, I kept nodding off and like, you know, it's supposed to keep you awake. Luckily there was a, a nurse or someone in the hallway who was in there talking about, Oh yeah, you don't know who DJ drama is. He was, he did all little Wayne's mixtapes in the two thousands, whatever, whatever. And they violated the HIPAA law. Um, and I was, I, if, if I, if they would have kept me in there, I went to, I had to go shoot this movie, you people, I had to go shoot you people and I would have missed it. And because they violated the HIPAA laws, I was able to get out early and leave the facility. And, um, you know, even I remember going on that movie set and during um, breaks of filming, having a conversation with Jonah just about his struggles with um, addiction and things of that nature. And we, Jonah Hill. Yeah, Jonah Hill. And we had a really like in-depth, like, you know, heart to heart talk. And I, I told him like, man, like I literally just was in the hospital, like because of my addiction. And, you know, he, he really opened up to me and like gave me some, some good, some good guidance and good advice. And I, I knew at that moment that I really, you know, I just, I wanted to get clean. Cause yeah. I used to tell Amy all the time, like my biggest fear is ending up like Michael Jackson or Prince, you know, and just like opioids is such a, a dangerous drug because like, you know, there's no, there's no end in sight, you know, and if it can take the lives of Michael Jackson or Prince, like huh, who the fuck am I? You know what I'm saying? And the fear was like, was, that was always my fear, like death. You know what I'm saying? So I went on, I was going back on tour again in 2022 with Wiz and Logic. And I was scared because you know, I felt like I only had like three options. Three options were I'm, I'm either going to go on tour and I'm going to buy an abundance of perks and be taking too many, or I'm going to go on tour and I'm not going to have them and I'm going to be going through withdrawals, or I'm going to go on tour without them and be trying to find them and buying them from somewhere where I shouldn't be and they're going to have fentanyl in them and it's going to be a hazard. So I called the the rehab place that I um, had went to before Mount Sinai and maybe like a, a week before tour. And I just was like, look, I'm about to leave. I just need to try to detox for a couple of days before I go. And I went there and I got on the boxing, which I had gotten on the time before, but I didn't stay on it. And this time when I left um, to go on tour, I stayed on the boxing. And that's the detox drug? Suboxone is a yeah, it's a it's a drug that they give people to detox off of opioids. It blocks the receptors in your brain that most people get high from opioids off of. Does it block the craving to do it? Yeah, it does. It blocks the cravings as well. Because by blocking the receptors, it it doesn't allow you to have those cravings. In a sense, it seems like there's two cravings. Like there's a physical craving, like your physic, your body's physically addicted, but there's also a mental craving of just wanting that feeling of escape. Absolutely. Does it block the mental craving as well? Um, I would think so, but you know, some of that maybe is just kind of like a, a mental thing in its own. Yeah. You know, for me, it was more of me wanting to stop anyway, and the hardest part at that moment was more of the the physical addiction and you know not not wanting to go through the pain of the withdrawals and the things of that nature yeah. but if there is the boxing or supplicate like there is a part of it that definitely 
stops your the, the, the mental craving as well, you know. Um, so, yeah, so when I got back from tour or when I ran into Shanti, I had at that moment in time had been like six months clean or seven months clean, probably the longest I had, had been clean since I had started taking opioids. And, you know, I knew that, you know, when we started talking, she was, she asked me if I would be open to share my story. And I know that, you know, a person like myself in the position that I was in, especially when no one, no one was aware of, of my addictions or my issues and that, and with that, you know, me sharing my story could help someone else out. So, um, yeah, you know, she offered and gave me the platform to speak on it. And, you know, I was more than happy to do so. Yeah. How prevalent are opioids in Atlanta, just like in your circles? Like, I mean, we hear about people drinking lean all the time. We see people holding styrofoam cups, but how prevalent actually is it? How big of a problem is it? It's very, it's, it's like common. I mean, those were everywhere. I mean, that was even what happened when I got back on them. I mean, you know, I was able to stay clean in those early months because the world was shut down and, Mm -hmm. you know, I wasn't outside or I wasn't, I wasn't in places where I could get them. But as soon as kind of like things started to open back up or I was, you know, out and about in Atlanta and Atlanta was somewhere that was open a little more earlier than most places, you know, I ran into, you know, people who were selling them or where I could, I could get them just that easy again. And, you know, or just even in regular circles of studio sessions and, you know, you know, people pop pills. It's like, it's, it's, it's a common thing, you know? So do people talk about addiction? Like, do you feel like now that you've been through what you've been through and you have more education behind it, do you want to reach out to people and help somebody who's, who you see might be dealing with addiction? Absolutely. I mean, definitely, because I know how easy it is, like, you know, for for it to become a problem, you know, and, yeah, you know, it's, it's scary. It's the, the scariest part and the most dangerous part is that, like, it was a five, six thousand dollar a month habit I had. Wow. I was spending close to six figures a year on, on opioids. And like, I was in a position where I could afford the type of habit of doing that. The average person can't do that. And the next step after opioids or not being able to, to afford consistent Percocets is heroin. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, the the average person or if you watch shows like Dope Sick or the new Netflix series Painkiller, like the more education I got about, you know, just the opioid crisis and and understanding, like it's it's so easy to see how people can fall into these traps, you know what I mean? And not even not even be aware of it, you know, because when I started out, I started out taking a five milligram Percocet and it was this feeling of euphoria. And then once you take that for a a period of time, it doesn't do anything. So then I have to take three of those. And the next thing you know, I'm taking 120 milligrams, you know, to feel that, that feeling. And throughout the whole day, like you would just, I would, that it got to that point in the habit. I would wake up, I would take a, a 30, then in the afternoon I would take a 30 and then at night I would take three thirties and a 15 or something to go to sleep. Did it affect your career in a negative way? It seems like, cause didn't you do Tyler's album during that time period? You know, I was able to really like hide it. I, I mean, you know, there was a time when I would, I, I was calling myself like a functional junkie, like not the, the, the tour I did last year, but the tour I did in 2019, in 2019, you know, I was on Percocet's, constantly but i would do them during a time like in between when i would have to work or i would you know i was working out every day and working and then you know still taking perks so i think i was i was able to hide it for the most part like it had more of a negative effect on my life more so than it did my career you know like your personal life yeah more of my personal life than so much my career 
Yeah, I imagine it can make you sort of withdraw from people emotionally. Yeah, it definitely does that. And it clouds your, your vision and, you know, doesn't, you don't always make the best logical decisions on them. So, mm. you know, it's just, it's yeah. just not good. They're just terrible. Now that you've had a little bit of distance from it, what do you do to stay resilient? What do you do to stay clean? I look forward to the 22nd of every month because it's, it's a, another monthly anniversary of my sobriety. I hit a year on July 22nd. So now this will be, thank you. So now this is 13 months. And, you know, I get more fulfillment and enjoyment of the longevity of staying clean and sober than I do from wanting to take a Percocet and never wanting to go back to that. You know, it's not worth it. Do you continue to take some sort of medication? Yeah, there's a, there's a, I take a shot. It's called a supplicate shot, which I take monthly. And that definitely is supposed to help with, you know, cravings or, or even feeling the effects of an opioid. You know, I remember a time recently or a couple of times recently where they've been right in my face, you know, around and I had no desire to, engage or indulge and I was extremely proud of myself for that we have to take another quick break and then we'll come back with more from Leah Rose and DJ Drama we're back with the rest of Leah Rose's conversation with DJ Drama so I wanted to ask you a little bit about your background what was your your home life like, like early childhood? Like, what do you remember about the house you grew up in? Was it a house filled with music? Were your parents into music? Yeah. So I grew up between my mother and my father. They split up when I was around two. And I, I spent like equal amount of times between both households. But my dad was a, a, a huge doo-wop fan. And he had a a large record collection. I remember my mom had a lot of, a lot of records too. And they definitely both played a lot of music uh, within the household. And my dad, my dad also listened to a lot of jazz. My mom listened to a lot of jazz, a lot of early eighties R and B seventies R and B. And, you know, I, I just remember, you know, being introduced to hip hop at a, at an early age, you know, having a keen love for it. But even overall, even just a, a keen love for music, like I, you know, I'm, I grew up as listening to Big Daddy Kane and Guns N' Roses, KRS One and Metallica. Did you ever feel like, because being mixed race, your, your dad is black, your mom is white. Yeah. Did you ever have a, a period where you felt like you had to sort of pick a side? Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as a young, child you know i definitely had some identity issues you know definitely being so fair-skinned or light-skinned um you know and my father always instilled in me like about my blackness and you know at a young age it was kind of confusing because it was like he would tell me that i'm black and i'd be like well okay but my mom's white and you know just i would always get questioned a lot like about what I what I was or, you know, how to how to identify myself. So, you know, it would go from me saying I'm black to me saying I'm mixed or me having to explain to people or what have you, or, you know, being fair skinned, but having, you know, certain features like big lips or curly hair and, you know, just like um growing up in I guess the eighties and the nineties in that time, like there definitely were some some times of, of confusion or, or trying to, you know, who to identify with more or picking a side or things like that, or, you know, friend groups and, you know, just yeah. school and, you know, things like that. Yeah. How did your parents meet? They met because they both were very active in like conscious and liberal political movements. So they met kind of both working around civil rights in the, the mid to late 70s. 
Cool. Yeah. Philadelphia seems like a very politically active city. Definitely, yes. Okay. So in addition to everything that you've built with the mixtapes, with, um, you know, with your podcast, with the albums you've released, you also have now a label imprint called Generation Now, and you've signed two of the most now successful hip-hop artists, Little Uzi Vert, Jack Harlow, and they're really living up to the name of the imprint. Yeah. Just talk about how you found them or what it was about them that you knew that you wanted to sign them. A lot of it was their conviction upon meeting them, their own desire to be great, to be stars, to be, you know, the best of the best. You know, they both kind of, in a sense, like went against the grain. You know, that's something that, Mm -hmm. you know, I've always been keen of. Like, even if you look at my story about, you know, this kid from Philly who moved to Atlanta and dominated, you know, Southern mixtape scene. Like, you know, Little Uzi wasn't the, the, the norm of what people were used to of artists of what Philadelphia artists sound like. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, that definitely attracted us to him. But how did you know he would have longevity? Like when you were starting to talk to him and hear his music, like how did you know that he's someone who's worth investing long term in? I mean, to be honest, I don't I don't know if you ever really do you know. I mean, it's like it's it's the music business. I mean, it's it's all a gamble, you know. I mean, I definitely saw the talent in him you know i saw his again it's it's the conviction like he knew he was a rock star and you know he was always very confident of like how dope his shit was or you know jack is you know there's videos of jack rapping at 12 and 13 like i I stand behind his ability to want to be great and to want to have longevity and to you know wanting to be a great performer and you know what she all he wasn't always but you know i mean i again he was a sponge that you know we watched like soak it up and we're able to lend lend our shoulders to artists and bring the the knowledge and the you know the 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 years of legacy that we have and and, you know to help them further their careers when you and lake and cannon are talking about signing Jack Harlow to Generation Now, that becomes a huge cosign for Jack and that can change the trajectory of his career. Right. What was it about him that made you confident? I just was always impressed of how comfortable in his his own skin he was and like Mm -hmm. his knowledge of, you know, of hip hop or, you know, we we had a a fond... um, interest in the same films and movies and you know watching him rap like you know lyric lyrically and like what he the conversations i had with him of of what he where he wanted to be and you know where he wanted to go as an artist like he wanted to be one of the greats and like like, you know that was enough for me that was like here's this kid from louisville kentucky that looks like napoleon dynamite that you know like it's going to shock the world. So, you know, I, again, I, I just think like I've always found a lot of success in, in somewhat kind of like going against the grain. And I remember having conversations with the label and, you know, some people being a little skeptical about assigning a white artist. And I was like, look, it's not, it's not the year 2000 anymore. Like Eminem's not yeah. the only one that can exist. Like, you know, just, just sit, sit back and watch what we do. And, you know, we did it again. Yeah, you guys have had tremendous success. Congratulations on thank you on all the success. What are you working on now? Like, what's next? I know you're working on probably a million things. I am. Um, I'm in the process of finishing up a book deal. Who? Memoir. Potentially a memoir. Stay tuned. Generation now. We have our our management um, company, so we we now have a uh, little Tyler, Ruby Rose, Mariah, the scientist on Generation Now Management. We're in the process of signing some new artists, one of them uh, being this artist named Kai Cash and another one that we'll announce very soon. I'm finishing up this tour with Snoop and Wiz and 
we're gonna go right into start working on a new album. And then we all we're working on um, some film projects as well. How are you sleeping now? Like a baby. I just sleep peacefully, you know. I'm at, I'm at a space and where, you know, life is amazing. I I get up, I, I work out, and you know, my day is pretty fulfilled. If it's a normal average day, I put my ass to bed about eleven, eleven thirty. That's great. Thank you so much, Drama, for doing this. Absolutely. I appreciate you so much, and I'm so proud of you. I appreciate and that. So good to be connected again. No, for sure. It's great to talk to you after all this time. Thanks to DJ Drama for being so open about his addiction and recovery. We wish him continued success. And personally, I look forward to the return of the greatest mixtape series of all time with the Dedication 7 whenever that drops. You can hear all of our favorite official DJ Drama tracks on a playlist at BrokenRecordPodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Ben Tolliday, and Eric Sandler. Our editor is Sophie Crane. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you love this show and others from Pushkin, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted ad-free listening for $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.